SBS warns that the following program contains graphic material that may be distressing to some viewers. This is a film about work, about work in a time of change. As the culture of government transforms into the corporate management of the state, every organisation is feeling the impact of the changes. The Melbourne Metropolitan Ambulance Service is one of the largest ambulance services in the world. It takes 172,000 calls a year, 470 a day, day in and day out. It too is being remodelled to deliver quality service within budget constraints. Downsized and radically restructured, with everything except the core business of emergency work privatised and outsourced, the MAS is now a lean and mean organisation, but its workload is increasing by more than 10% a year, and it still has to compete for its share of the $17 billion a year business of government. These are turbulent times, and change is not easy for anyone. Metropolitan Ambulance Service has got a history of about uh, 10 years. In that time, I'm the fourth CEO. We've had um, three committees of management and numerous inquiries into, into ambulance operations. I, can, I contend that, um, you know, what MAS needs and has needed for, for quite some time is a period of stability. The most public and contentious of the changes has been the introduction of Intergraph, an American company specialising in computer-aided dispatch. But perhaps the most difficult has been the MAS decision to adopt a new call-taking procedure known as AMPDS. In the old days, ambulance officers took the calls and dispatched the ambulances. On-road experience informed the decisions made. Now this crucial part of the service has been privatised. Now civilian operators take the calls. They go through the carefully devised AMPDS protocol of questions and answers with the caller. All right, can you give me a phone number? And then the system, the Advanced Medical Priority Dispatch System, determines who or what should be sent. Authorised by the service's medical officers, the implementation of AMPDS has irreversibly changed the culture of ambulance. Intergraph was awarded the contract to operate the call-taking system and dispatch grid. The company was invited to participate in this film. They declined. Intensive care ambulances are part of the emergency fleet that MAS runs round the clock. Known as MICA units, they are crewed by paramedics who are highly trained to deal with acute emergencies. Under the new system, if a MICA unit is the closest vehicle, it is often dispatched to non acute cases. Response times drive the agenda. So you've, you've called us basically because of the fall? Yeah, well, he was really distressed. And yeah. was, um, but when we got him sort of settled a bit and got him back onto the bed and got him the oxygen, he's settled a bit now. Right. Yeah. Mm. Doctor don't want to see me anymore now, man. Don't they? No. They get pretty well then. Just breathing is fairly normal for him like that now, is it? Yeah. That's fine, your blood pressure's fine, your heart rate's fine. 
Mm. Okay, John, are we going to hospital or not? How do you feel? You don't think so? Do you think he's back to normal? Yourself? No. Sure? Ooh. Mm. Well, you sure? No, I don't think so. You don't want to go to hospital? No. I'm positive. No. Okay. I'll just get a form from the sign and uh, we'll leave you to him. Yeah. Okay. If you're tied up doing a non-market job and uh, a job goes off that requires micro level of care and you're unavailable, then that can be quite frustrating. I suppose there's some satisfaction in taking someone to hospital who needs to go, but there's even more satisfaction in, in having someone who was, say, really critically ill, and by the time you get them to hospital, uh, they've improved dramatically, and that's a great deal of satisfaction. But it ha it's happening sort of infrequently these days, that my enthusiasm for the job's waning, I'm sick of the politics, I'm sick of the changes. That's probably what's hurting people the most, is the old ways of doing things which were easy, but not necessarily efficient, but were known, have actually been replaced by processes they have to follow. Ultimately, they're more efficient, but it's difficult to change. Prior to the restructure, David Ryan was a micro-paramedic. Now, armed with a Masters in Business Administration, he is in charge of emergency operations. I have to admit that out of the result of the change, obviously I'm someone who has benefited. So to me, I look back and think this has been good. However, during that time, I also at times thought, is this the right way? Is this where we're going? Is this how it should happen? Okay. These days, David Ryan is responsible for the on-road performance of 45 emergency ambulance and 10 MICA teams. Supplemented by extra vehicles at peak times, the fleet covers an area of 9,000 square kilometres. Well, why don't we just put it in a new area and create a new team? We need a new car. Yeah, that's right. We need new cars. And you see, the thing is, we're still backfilling. Like other public service managers, Peter Olzak, a former engineer, has to find ways to develop a commercial focus. He has to make MAS competitive and efficient, and he has to cut costs. It's actually talking about a new support car. Yeah, but the new support cars, where they're planned, aren't the highest need areas for paramedic cars. For MAS management, pressure comes from many quarters. Peter Olzak faces the media over a performance review of his organisation to be handed down later that day by the state's Auditor-General. What about the shortage of emergency vehicles? The shortage of emergency vehicles um, is something that is, is of concern. However, we're, we're, we're achieving the best performance um, that MAS has achieved for quite, for quite some years. And that is, again, total time to, to respond to an emergency of, of 14 minutes, 90% of the time. Surely Victoria needs an ambulance service that's going to grow with its increasing demand and it's it sounds like you're just not being resourced to keep up with that demand. We, we, ha we have put in a three-year plan in terms of uh, a three-year plan to the department that identifies the issues that you're raising and we are currently discussing those issues with the department. MAS has requested $14 million from the state government to make the plan a reality. Do you think your demands will be met though? Yes, I'm very confident. We have a very strong case. The Auditor-General has hit out over Melbourne's ambulance services. In a report tabled in Parliament this afternoon, Ches Baraguana said an additional 23 ambulances were needed. He said that while response times had improved, they were still below standard and must be improved. The service's chief executive, Peter Olzak, says the report showed the need for more government funding. However, if, if the workload keeps going up, something's got to give. Micah like Four. Micah 4 shares round-the-clock emergency coverage of the city's inner north with the Preston 157 ambulance. Each vehicle does about 100 jobs a week. Okay, Pete, listen, I'm Paul, mate. Open your eyes. 
Try not to move too much for me, mate. We'll sort you out. Everything's all right, OK? Everything's all right. Just relax. Thanks. Peter. All right. Can you keep everyone quiet? Yeah. Can Can you grab that black bag for us? Peter, is it? Ah! Don't move, mate. No cups. I'm not no, no sure. Joy. I'm in. Pardon? No joy. I'm not sure. You're doing very well, Paul. I'm waiting for one. Oh. He's doing no, pop one in that side, mate. Oh. No, I think it's in. Oh. Suck, suck, suck. Right there. Right, little needle sting in this hand, Peter, OK? Oh. Keep still, keep still. Oh, I need him to keep his arms straight, yeah. this arm. Oh. Got some more, too, Steve? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Down you go. OK, down. Right. No, no don't, don't move, mate. Don't no, move. We're going to put you on this board now. No, That's a boy. No, no, no. That's it. And go. Don't move your head, mate. Oh. oh. I'm just going to put a little bit of tape on your head, OK? Just close your eyes for me. Open them. Good boy. What's your address? Well done. Do you know what day it is today? OK. What grade are you in? Grade five. Wow. There's no one here. Yeah, we're going to get it off in a minute, it's all right, when we get you onto the hospital bed. Because the hospital is, uh, is running to capacity, the A&E department is quite full and very busy, they had their two ER cubicles, their emergency resuscitation cubicles, they had patients in them, and they tried to get me to go to another hospital, tried to reject or not accept this case, and I had to be quite firm about it. We're only two or three minutes away from this hospital, and the next hospital might be 15 minutes. About his head, chest is fine, abdo's been fine, hemodynamically fine with the blood pressure around 120. Uh, if you put the pressure on, they seem to cope. So, I mean, they cleared that cubicle out, they made room for us, and uh, I mean, rightly so. Ambulance uh, managers and ambulance officers certainly focus on the patient treatment aspects of the job and they do it very well and very caringly. However, there's, there's the, the sharp end of the, the business as well and that is you know, getting the dollars and making sure that the dollars um, are there to, to provide that level of service. And um, you know, we're, when I say we, the, the non-ambulance managers, myself included, as, uh, like the financial and operational conscience of the organisation. We're always trying to eke as much out of the system as we possibly can simply because we don't have enough to do what we need to do in a very um, significant way. So there's a lot of thrust in the organisation trying to work out how we can get as much as we can out of our ambulances at the moment in terms of utilisation. 18B, 16B, 24. Why does that look a little bit out of... It's a Ferrari. It is a Ferrari. Why is there a Ferrari here? I don't want to be harsh, but you don't see a lot of Ferraris in Preston. Oh, I've gone past it, yes. You've gone past it. You've gone past it. <laughs> Preston Road. Peter and Jared have been dispatched in the Preston Road car to a 39-year-old female with vomiting and diarrhoea. Right. Oh, hold on a second. I'll come in and we'll have a word. Okay. Now, I've been having a lot of headaches. Yeah. <laughs> you dig. I've been having a lot of... Get my budgie on. Get my budgie on. All right, Linda. Yeah. Linda, let's, let's talk about what made you call us here tonight. OK? Uh, I, I was sick in the seat. Yeah. And I had... Um... So you vomited once. Yeah. Yep. I was vomited the other night as well. How, how long ago was that? What, the other night? Yeah. Two nights ago. Two nights ago. Would you like us to get the doctor to come and see you here? Not really. All right. Whereabouts do you keep your keys, mate? Yeah, in my... In my... 
Okay. All right. I'll hang on to those if I can for a moment. We'll take them with us, but I'll hang on to those. You gonna take you take this bag? What's all this? Don't worry, you got the budgie guard in the house, mate. <laughs> Jeez, I wish I was that quick. <laughs> I wish you were that quick too. Mate. As it turns out, when we brought her here, she's been seen here twice in the last two days. Our workload with relation to those type of cases has increased over the last few years. What we're finding more and more of is that uh, a lot of these patients we're attending have been deinstitutionalised. And when they're well, they tend to cope well, but if just any little minor illness or, or minor social problem, um, because they don't have someone there to go to, they tend to call the ambulance and immediately want to go to hospital or to go somewhere where they can can be with someone. If the, we're going to be attending jobs like that, and increasingly we attend jobs like that, then we're not going to be available in other respects for other jobs as they come up. Take me home. While the ambos wear the impact of cuts elsewhere in the health system, at headquarters, management are working on how to increase their slice of the pie. In a world of diminishing resources, being able to quantify what you do is a core survival strategy for any organisation. There's been changes in virtually every element of what we're trying to, to deliver and are delivering in many cases. Uh, I think the point is that it's not just delivering, it's improving what we do. And to do that, you need to be able to measure it, review it and improve it. And so the change for the workforce is those things being occurring. In the past, they didn't. Or if they did, it didn't happen all the time. And it was hard to identify what the outcome was. But the good part about it, the system changing from now on is it'll change from a perspective of good, sound, um, empirical data, not some knee-jerk reaction about, oh, we had this bad case last week and um, we need to change all our protocols. So if you're going to make a decision at MAS now, it has to be a sound decision. It has to be based on fact. It has to be based on data. Kevin's starting to do his job. <laughs> Performance measurement is the contemporary management tool for eking more out of the system. Every month, David Ryan and Peter Olzak meet with each of their group managers to assess team performance. Kevin Maskey is the group manager responsible for the Preston and Micah Four teams. What's happened to, what's happened to the, um, the at, at, at hospital times? They're flying out. The only... Well, I don't know. I mean, the only thing we can... What can we do about it, I suppose, is the next question. We monitor our time at hospital, which um, is one area where I think there could be significant improvement. I, I guess the, the, the average would, have been, would be about 20 minutes. That's what we're looking for in terms of the average, yes. Like a four. Well, their hospital times are a little bit better than my ones. Um, it's still 40 minutes, though. If the time crews spend at hospitals can be reduced, they will be more available for on-road jobs. There'll be more resources. There wouldn't be this pressure on uh, to try and reduce our hospital times. I don't purposely go out there to, to, um, to delay getting ready for the next job. But occasionally, um, you may be so hard pressed with work that you haven't got time to stop, that you just need that five or 10 minutes breather just to come back down to Worth again to get ready for the next assault. The offenders in custody, thank you. Affirmative, and uh, has received those details. Stemming. Stemming.
that curry tastes delicious. Mm, absolutely. It's a bit sombering. Isn't it? <laughs> a bit dry. Michael Paul's approach. So, so can you grab me a torch, please? It's got to be a four to six double wounds. Come on, Brooke, it's OK. Can I have the monitor, please? We've got multiple stab rooms, probably a pneumothorax. Who's with her? Is anyone with her? No, no, no. no. She was by herself, was she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up a line in that side. Just watch it, there's a large laceration up there. I've got no blood pressure at all, Tony, so if you've got a tension there. Well, yeah, it is. It's a large cut there. Can one of you guys let uh, the Austin know we'll be coming in? Multiple stab wounds, no blood pressure, altered conscious state. <laughs> Oh. Our lights OK? I'll see if I can get them to work. No, no I'll, I'll give me half a second. I think it'll be all right. Just before Evan, you ring uh, the Austin. I can't put a line in here because, look, you've got to wonder where it's going to go. I know. So do you want to pop it? There's a crutch out there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I get flat enough. OK, good. Yeah. Do you want to do a test? Wayne, just pull over for a second. Good. Air entry's fine. So don't move. Just don't move your arms. Okay, both funny. That one's not. It's that one. Take it. It's right. Damn. What they need to be sure is that she hasn't got air escaping into uh, outside the lung region and that's compressing her lungs and preventing her from breathing. The other issue is blood fluid uh, compressing the lungs in this situation. Uh, so they've put in some tubes to evacuate any air or blood from that region. Her blood pressure is quite good and her heart rate stabilised. Uh, it has a respiratory status. Uh, so, uh, in terms of that, it looks reasonably uh, reasonably favourable in terms of the outcome. All right. All right. Yeah, I've just. Um, had to book the car unavailable because we've blown the uh, auxiliary side charging on the, the alternator. So that, that actually made it quite difficult for us, that job, because we run out of lights and you can't work in the dark. Someone's driving along the road, been run off the road by someone else. They've been yanked out of the car and stabbed ten times. It, you can't help but be horrified by that. But you tend to separate yourself from that in the early stages, and it's not until probably afterwards you start to think about the emotional issues. I think that generally, uh, paramedics, ambulance officers tend to separate themselves from the emotions at the scene, but then later on you might go back and you know you really become quite emotional. So. Uh, Silver top taxis have notified us of uh, at this address. 40, approximately 45 year old gentleman found unconscious, crewing an arrest. Five cars on a one. While it's life and death out on the streets for the Ambos, management still has to communicate its performance objectives to the teams. Group manager Kevin Maskey visits Micah Four over the issue of time spent at hospitals. To a doctor. Um, so can you narrow them down with the statistics they present yeah, to yeah, her what can, cruise? So has there been specific issues in terms of, I mean, don't well, no, name no, anyone, no, no, is it done, across the board? No, I haven't done that yet, right. so no, that's, that's what I thought of doing. <clears throat> I mean, that's the other issue, that it might be just squads. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and it, I mean, if you've got that information, if it's your squad, <laughs> you know, oh, well, if it's your crew, if it's you two, you'd say, well, we either, you know, I'd say, get staffed or you're smart and you're act up. Mm. And often, most people sort of feel a bit embarrassed about being worst, I would think. Sure. What we've done is we've spent eight months 
giving information to the teams. Now we're giving the, the teams the information of themselves and the other teams in each of their groups, their operational groups, so they can look at each other as a group performance and see whether they're out of sync. Some of the teams have dropped their times by anything up to 20%. We're here to talk about a significant change that's changing a lot of your lives. It's the, the introduction of the MPDS system, which always seems to be linked to the coupling of all kinds of other changes in the process. The MPDS is version 10. Jeff Clawson is the inventor of the AMPDS call taking protocol, which has been installed in the Intergraph control room. Between 10 and 10 2. I've got a whole bunch of cases right here, given some time that we're gonna play to listen to what happens when dispatchers don't follow protocol by the numbers. Because where you don't follow the protocol, you forget stuff. I go to Montreal and I see the dispatchers functioning at nearly 100% compliance. Oh, 98, 99. I have a religious experience. They follow the protocol by the numbers. They can't remember when they didn't do it that way. Without In this world, it's not just the teams whose performance is being measured. David Ryan has had the task of developing performance indicators to test the effectiveness of the call-taking system in the light of the government's massive investment. One, one of the very, very important things that's happening now is that we're doing uh, outcome studies on, on the way we actually do respond to people, so that, in fact, we now have, uh, I think, a database of 722 cases where we've looked at the uh, responses assigned by Endograph, looked at the... Uh, diagnosis made by the ambulance crew followed up with what the hospital emergency department have decided was wrong and at this point in time Indigraph get it right 88 percent of the time our crews get it right 94 percent of the time uh, and that's it's that's the important point this crews spend five or ten minutes assessing the patient in front of them and get it there's six percent more correlation with patient outcome than the call takers do it as a third party i have a lot of officers saying that they just send us to anything and they don't care uh, what they send us to and how they send it and I think there's a lack of understanding about what goes into the process just like Paul was saying into into delivering um, the appropriate response for the appropriate case. Tony, do you want to come up? Person 157. 157, thank you. Case 1288, number 10, Little Grove in 18 84-year-old female complaining of a swollen tongue. No shortness of breath. On a code two, please. Yeah, Roger received a swollen tongue. Did you speak to someone at the clinic? Uh, did you see any of the... No, did you speak to someone at the oh, clinic? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, she said to me, better be in the ambulance. Can't get anybody just come around. That's Sheree here from the ambulance service. We're here with patient Lorna Ford. Um, her tongue's swollen up again, and uh, the tablets that she's got for it, the Clarentine, are actually out of date and they're not working. Do you have any of your prednisolone tablets? Do you have any of your prednisolone tablets? He said that you had some prednisolone tablets. Do you have tablets anywhere else other than in this drawer? No. These are the only ones you have. Oh, she's got this okay, nice drawer. Okay. You don't take any other tablets at all? Oh, yes. Oh, we do. Yeah. We okay, what yeah. have we got up here? Yeah. Spies 1196. Yep, they're out of date too. You got no problems with your breathing at all? No. No. Alright. I'll go for just ring deep and ring another up to the, the doctors. I could ring my. Oh, my uh, Swoll swollen tongue. Um. She's on some medication for that. She's had it for 11 years, but her tablets are out of date and uh, she hasn't got a script and she's got no way of getting up to the doctors. It's just up in Bruce Street in Gilbert Road. Do you mind if we just run her up there and just drop her at the doctors? We've cleared it with our boss so we can just give you a lift up there, but you'll have to find your own way from the doctors. Yeah, I'll the text you, Okay? Okay. All right. He said just call in clear after we've dropped her off. Okay. And we're the only car within Kui. Yeah. Okay, we're off. You have a bad room with tongue? <laughs> a good looking tongue it is too. When I first started, uh, I used to go up in the control room when I was based at City Branch and you'd take quite, quite often take some phone calls and see some experienced controllers telling people, look, you don't need an ambulance and hanging up in their ear. 
Um, these days, people ring up, and no matter what the problem is, if they want an ambulance, they get one. AMPDS was supposed to, to, to knock a lot of this out. It was supposed to make a, a far better dispatching system. But, uh, you know, we're getting jobs, uh, unknown incidents, hemorrhage from a dangerous area, sick person, no priority. You know, what are they? You know, how, how hard is it to get that sort of information out? You'll always get the case where, where an ambulance officer will, 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 say, will say that, you know, um, the information that I was given was, it was less than, than optimum. I think you have to put that into perspective that that particular ambulance officer wasn't on the receiving end of the phone call, the initial phone call. And I do sympathise with the ambulance officers when that happens. But we have to give the, the caller and the patient the benefit of the doubt. A lot of the work we uh, are dispatched on, we sort of think that this is maybe inappropriate. And uh, a lot of the time we're right. You know? We're either cancelled or we get there and it it's, doesn't require micro-intervention. And, uh, and of course, it, uh, you know, if you've done six or seven of those and it's four o'clock in the morning and, you know, for instance, the other night I had, had a meal at two o'clock in the morning, it's the first time I could eat. You know, short of eating, you know, bits of snack, you know, picking up a biscuit at the hospital or something like that, you know, it wears you down. There are perhaps patient types in the past that weren't as well serviced or serviced to a different level. That's not the decision of the ambulance officer, it's not the decision of us. The community requires that when they ring, we respond. That's our charter. If they don't like that, they should get the ambulance act changed. Overtime is running at four to five million dollars a year. Recruitment is now a hot issue in forward planning. But it takes two years to train a student ambo. And absorbing them into the teams for training creates a rostering nightmare. Appendix one looks at the current potential roster placements we've got now. Appendix two looks at the proposed roster. And then appendix three looks at the impact of that roster and the change in the number of student places. Basically what it does is takes the potential number or theoretical number of student places from 114 to 144. The recruitment strategy is about on one hand reducing our costs because we need to get to optimum numbers to reduce our overtime. But it's also about looking at um, if we're required to put more resources on the road to both meet workload increases or to improve performances into the future, what's our capacity going to be to do that? And what we're seeking to do there is to increase that capacity by looking at the constraints in the process and seeing how we can loosen up some of those constraints, how we can put more people through the system. 144 places. So we've got an increase of 30 places. You know, there's a lot of assumptions in that roster. And a lot of issues. And a lot of issues as well. I mean, so all of this is dependent on us getting some... To implement, it's obviously money. dependent on getting some money. Yeah, but it's a catch-22. The issue is how far we go in pursuing yeah. it yeah. while there's still uncertainty about when the money. One other issue that was discussed last week was the 40 hours versus the 42. Two hours. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you were going to get Wilton to have a look at a... Um, a version of that 40 hour roster yeah. converted to 42. We'll, we'll have to have a look. We'll have to just extend out the, what we've got and see if we can develop a 42 hour one. So this roster's around a 40 hour option. Yeah, okay. Okay. The issue with that is in more people. Yeah. So, and the last, last and time. you're taking hours off people. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's that. So there's two parts. There's the, the in potential industrial side, but there's the issue is that you actually need more people to run it because yeah. you, each person's only working. 40 hours. Well, Claire, when, when would you have the 42 hour version of it done? Um. <laughs> While management explores the options, Phil is sent on another job as the closest available car. Down the end. Down the end, yeah. Oscar, come on, wake up. The ambulance here, mate. What have you done? You don't want to live anymore, why not? 
So how much alcohol have you had? How many tablets have you taken? We need to know how many you've had today, how many tablets you've had today. It's important. How many, roughly? Have you taken the whole bottle? So, so what was he drinking? Was it a bottle of wine or...? Yeah, it was a bottle of wine. White wine, red wine? I'm not sure. It was pinky colour. Just the one? Yeah. Okay, Oscar, we'll pop you down to the hospital. Okay? There's nothing to worry about. The drugs he's taken aren't gonna, aren't gonna kill him. All right? But he's sleep very soundly for a while. Excuse me, you're going to be okay, all right? There's nothing to be upset about, all right? They're just going through a bad time at the moment. Okay, he's going to live. Get into the bottle of stairs. Okay. Come on, Oscar. Stand up on me, please, mate. Oscar, stand up. Come on. Oscar, we need you to help us. You're a heavy bloke. Come on. Now stand up. That's it. Come on. Concentrate. We can't lift you because you're too heavy. Concentrate and walk. Well, we were dispatched to this case in Mill Park from Heidelberg because we were the closest car. This is the cordon endograph, and uh, that's a distance of 12 or 13 kilometres. Uh, it means that all the other resources around the area were unavailable. They were obviously doing other work. Don't you be sick of my ambulance, buddy. We really need to, as a management team, be very, very clear on the advantages and the disadvantages of all the models and then say, OK, for these reasons, this is the best model. And then we need to bring the, em the employees along. And, you know, we, we've, we've, got to, we've got to do a marketing job to ensure that, you know, if, if there's some anxiety out there, and there will be, that we've, we've got to try and alleviate that, that as much as possible. Because I, you know, with all the models that we're talking about, long term, there's, go there's going to be some stress. You're actually re you're reducing overtime, you're disrupting people, you're moving them out of the, the branch they may have worked at for some time. You're asking them to work at other branches um, that they might not be familiar with, with people they're not familiar with. Uh, and it might not be the same branch, you know, two weeks in a row. So the impacts of what we're talking about there um, can be quite profound in terms of how it, imp how it affects the individual. And the legacy of mistrust that is a result of previous and turbulent change is still strong. Look, personally, I think that management would be would be far better off or far, what, what's the term, perceived better from the troops if we were open to this information or, you know, privy to this sort of information. If, if they say, look, this is what we want to do, guys, but, I, I mean, there's industrial issues, there's union issues, and I think that they are trying to probably resolve it, get approval before they enter into those industrial issue, issues. While everyone ponders the uncertainties of the future, the jobs keep coming in. I had a gangrene gold bladder mm -hmm. and Mr. Simon Banting done that at St Vincent's private because okay. I paint my HBA top bracket. Mm. This pain in your back, is that a new pain? No, I had it last night. You can feel the bumps. Look here. I right, just let it go. Oh, just there. Yeah. What would you like us to do for you now? Just a drink first. Out of the fridge. Yeah. What, what? All right. Medically, what would you like us to do for you now? Oh, take me to St V's. You want to go into St V's? Yes, because Mr Keck will come and see me then too also. I've got your keys here, Elma. Let's go. What is the electricity? Elma, you need to get going. Mum. What if my house burned because I can't get another one? Smile. No manners. Give me all your bags and stuff. Okay, I need to jump onto that one. Mm. 
were dispatched to this lady who had a fall at three o'clock this morning. She was assessed then by an ambulance crew and it was suggested then that she go into hospital for further assessment. She refused because she had to go home and get everything organised at home um, and take her car back and her groceries back and that sort of thing. So she's called us back six hours later and because she can't get rid of the headache that she's got from the fall. <laughs> Everything else is working okay. There doesn't seem to be any other injury of any sort. Um, but she wanted to come down to St Vincent's and service policy says that if they want to go to hospital then we take them. And uh, so we did. We brought her to St Vincent's. It's taken us out of service or unavailable for over an hour. And uh, yeah. That's about it. She could have quite easily gone by a taxi, could have got a friend to drive her, anything. She didn't need an emergency vehicle to take her to hospital. But uh, she knows the system, she wanted one and she got one. We seem to be so much busier these days. Uh, a case just went off just before, uh, a nursing home wanted a patient sent to the Melbourne from Reservoir for a blood transfusion. That's gone to an emergency car when basically that's a netcom job. But obviously netcom can't handle it. Uh, there doesn't appear to be enough Netcom cars to do the transport work and therefore you haven't picked up the pay Paul. There's not enough emerge cars to do the emerge work because they're doing transport work. We had an example the other day we were heading off to this job that was clearly not MICA and questionable whether it was even ambulance and there was an Eltham crew coming in from Diamond Creek requesting urgent MICA for a patient that was very, very unwell and the dispatcher said, oh, continue on to your job. And I suggested maybe you get a road car to go to this job and we could go and back up the other crew. Because and the that's dispatch... a known sick patient, a known quantity, so that, that would require a micro-intervention. And the, the yeah, dispatcher said, I can't change the dispatch grid. And, you know, you, it's, 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 it's madness. Absolutely. Like, I can't change the dispatch grid. You know, you need to use your common sense here, you know. Like, CAD is supposed to be computer-aided dispatch, but I think that we've moved to a system now where it's computer absolute dispatch. The utilisation of the grid and how it works is going to be refined, redesigned and looked at over time as part of how the MPDS committees work to review the data. Because you only see the case you went on. And it could be that they got it right or they didn't. But statistically speaking, they're following by following the protocol, a design pattern of medical practice is based on statistical probability. That's what medicine always is. This system is based on over 200 million cases, so the medical pro probability is quite high. We've now had it in Melbourne for over 12 months. We've serviced over 170,000 people in that time with it, and based on a review we've just finished of 1,500 of those patients, from the time they rang us to when they left hospital, we know that there was a 90% correlation between the information that we gathered with AMPDS, servicing the patient's best interest in their outcome. Now, you can't argue that data. There's been about four weeks of work going to try to configure 16-hour support cars into the 10, 14 roster to equate 42 hours a week. We've got one rostering officer now on Prozac and in a straitjacket. Um, and what we've come down to is that, quite simply, at the moment, we can't find anyone who can design the roster so it actually meets all those guidelines. A 42-hour roster gives you a benefit of a reduction of 5% of staff required for the same hours. So if we were to move totally to 40 hours, which also has an industrial or potential industrial implication, that will require an extra 27 staff over the three year period. Don't worry about it, stuff. We'll yeah. come back. Okay. No worries. Do you realise you are we'll uh, close okay. till we get no back? No worries. Okay. No worries, Jerry. See you later. See ya. Ready there to search. Um, she's hemorrhaging and able to stop it. She's coming home. Jani, what I want to do is just have a look down below just to make sure the baby's not coming. Yes. Is that okay? Oh. Oh. Thank you. 
hold the good long? No, no, we'll be there very shortly. Peter, oh. the last labour oh. was only two hours. And the contractions are now about four minutes, three to four minutes apart. Oh. Use that breathing, Rajani. So if you knew your couple of buffs, we're at the hospital now. Now they're expecting you here, so we're going straight up to the labour ward, OK? Oh. Oh. Push those numbers quick, mate. Don't want to make a mess in your lift. Maybe a little bit of onion there. That's it. That's fine. Good on you. See you, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm hungry. Signal three. Signal three. Craigie Mary, in a moment, uh, within the hour. Somebody expressed in 157. 1721, they've been hanging on to it for 30 minutes. Expressed in 157? Ask him. Roger that, we've just picked up a hot meal. Any chance of finishing that before we go? Then, uh, very static here. I know there was a question there, but I didn't quite hear it. Preston 157, can you just ask the clinician if it's okay if we finish our echo before we do this? As everyone struggles to meet the rising demands of the system, meal breaks can be a casualty of the race to keep up. Meanwhile, David Ryan may have found a way to make the numbers work on the proposed roster. And a 40-hour roster gives you all the things you need in the most simplistic form. The issue there is that how many of the staff will wish to move back from a 42 to a 40 hour roster and in doing that you actually have a, a an increased need of five percent for more staff to run the roster with the 42 hour roster you need fewer people because they're all working extra time now five percent on top of what we need equates to about nine people over two and a half years nine nine positions in total in yeah. total but if you look at $100,000 a position per annum, it still amounts to a cost that has to be... What are the benefits of doing that? You just well, the 40, ease of rostering. Well, the 40-hour roster gives you the most efficient, um, efficient application of the roster to where you actually need the shifts. Going to that um, Alexandra weekend for the trout fishing and stuff this weekend? Oh, yeah. Clear left. Yeah, she's a diabetic, I understand. She's a diabetic, but it's under it's control. Right. Uh, basically, they'll st we can still merge the two strategies together. It's just going to require uh, a bit more intensive management at the time. Okay. We're going to get the million bucks from four to five percent. Well, that's the issue. If we can't develop, that's why we've tried to develop a forty-two hour roster. Squeeze his hand for me. Two point five. That's low. I tried to make her drink a bit of orange juice. Thank you. All right, well, the first problem is that her blood sugars are low. Mm. Mm. Just relax, and it takes a couple <coughs> of minutes to work. <coughs> Can you hear me? No. No? You're supposed to say yes. Ma? Simplistically, and you'll get it in writing, is that Instead of having perhaps 105 people a year, you're going to have 115. So at the end of the year, you've got at least 10 more people recruited than you would have had. You can mitigate over time from there on. Yeah, so at the end of the three years, you'll have 30 more people than we can otherwise get through. And each person represents $100,000 basically a year and over time. The timing issue decreases some of that, but you're still in front. I want to have a look at him black and white, <laughs> all right. Trust me, trust me. <laughs> Hello, I'm the ambulance. Uh, Sit up. 
<coughs> Sit down. Have you got a tissue? Yeah. <coughs> Do you want to cough into this? Is it a bad? So what's for dear? Yeah. Oh my God. She's coming back. Thank God. Hmm. See, before she was just within half an hour, she was deteriorating. Oh, but she had the hair, but it she had just feels better. weak. We fixed that. Regarding the $14 million plan, yep. are you getting the sympathetic response from government that you hoped for? Sympathy we've got. <laughs> we've got plenty of sympathy. It's the hard, you know, the green stuff that we want. And plenty of it. You don't want you to fall down those steps. Has she got private health? Yeah. 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 Got private health? Yeah. All right. You might actually want to put slippery tiles when they're wet. Yeah. All right. Doing a bit of work to the patio. Watch spray. Uh, could you move in towards the city area, either central or city branch for coverage, please? Did you realise petrol bypass? Thank you.